Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon be, uh, peace be upon you. My name is Salam El Mariyadi with the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I'm really uh, delighted to have this guest with us uh, on on this broadcast. Um, he's a a rising star in our community. Um, has really worked uh, literally from the ground up uh, in making uh, success for for himself and and for his family. His, his name is David Kim, um, and he's running for Congress. And um, uh, he's running against Jimmy Gomez, uh, which is, I believe, part of Highland Park, Silver Lake, part of Koreatown, uh, other parts of Los Angeles, the, the Midtown area of Los Angeles. Um, and, um, you know, MPAC is not, cannot endorse, but uh, we offer these opportunities as a way of understanding the issues to educate the community and to encourage people to vote. Uh, so... Uh, I know David Kim has visited the Islamic Center on a couple of occasions, and he's, uh, I'm sure, has uh, a lot um, that he can offer our community and, and has learned a lot from us. So uh, I just wanted to start by asking David, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your upbringing, where you, where you grew up, and and uh, what you do now, besides uh, running for Congress, that is. Yeah, thank you so much, Salam, and everyone else for having me here at MPAC. Um, my, so my, my name is David Kim, as, as Salam had introduced. I am currently running for Congress. I um son of uh, Korean immigrant parents who came here um, without papers and uh, lived as undocumented the first few years. Um, I was born here, and through that, um, we've had the journey and uh, experiences that I think a lot of members of minority communities and marginalized communities have had. Um, and with that, we know what it's like to struggle, to, to survive, to not have somebody to speak for you, um, to represent you on your behalf. And that's all too familiar. And um, with my dad serving as a pastor um, in his religion, he really took upon that that servant's heart to really serve people, not just church members, but those outside of the church. And as a result, um, that was instilled in us, my brother and I growing up. And so it naturally became, um, I naturally became an attorney where currently I work as a public defender, but not on the criminal side. It's more the equivalent of that, but on the children's court side. So I'm a public defense attorney for uh, parents and children's court and these parents are the most vulnerable individuals of Los Angeles County um, who really have been shut out time and time over again by uh, not being able to have access to systems and resources not being able to have that generationally um, and so really fighting for these clients day in in every day in court every morning um, up until at least in, even into the afternoon every day and outside of the court advocating on their behalf, working with them to get on certain plans to get their children back. It's very obvious and clear that there's a majority of Americans right now currently, Salam, there's over 70% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that's reflective, not just in my clients, but in everywhere in our constituency in C34. So that's why we're running um, again, uh, we ran previously before, uh, came really close to winning, um, 59,000 versus 62,000 votes, 49% last cycle. But we're running again because things haven't gotten better and we want to represent all peoples. And so um, so that's why we're running. And, and I'm sure you have more questions. Well, yeah, I, I, I want to dive a little bit uh, deeper and we'll get into some foreign policy uh, later. But I want to ask you about this issue of uh, being undocumented. Um, a lot of the undocumented people, my, you know, I call them migrant workers. They they come here to to work and do jobs that nobody else wants to do. Um, and yet we and we take advantage of them. We take advantage of them in terms of the the uh, the hotel industry, hospitality industry, uh, obviously agriculture, um, uh, people cleaning and handymen and and all sorts of things. Um, yet. We don't want to give them any uh, public education, their children, public education or or healthcare. And I think was it Prop 87 in California that denied uh, education and healthcare mm -hmm. uh, 
or children of undocumented uh, uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants. How do you, how how do we navigate that issue now? And it was a big issue, obviously, in the presidential debate. Um, and and Trump was would say that oh you know uh, these 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 countries are just sending flocks and flocks of people to the United States and their crime is down and our crime is up. And then he made this outrageous accusation about Haitian immigrants in uh, Springfield, Illinois, and something having to do with eating pets and things like that, which was proven to be false. So, you know, you're, you're, you're living daily uh, with, with the barrage of attacks against you, yet you are contributing to the society. Um, how do you, how do you overcome that? I mean, it, it's, it seems um, highly uh, difficult, uh, practically impossible to get through that, but you did. And, and millions of undocumented people have done so. Um, if you could just share some experiences in going through as uh, children of undocumented Im immigrants and, and, and the day that you finally became uh, naturalized. Yeah, well, for for me, Salam, because I was born here, I yeah, I I got mine eventually, and and but my parents, I, I through the stories they were telling me, ha would have to go from one residence to another, sleeping at other people's places. Um, but it, it it's really definitely disappointing in the sense that this country that's known to be a land of freedom, of upholding certain values, freedom, justice for all, what does that really look like? How does that really play out? Um, are our current practices actually embodying that? And it's not. The answer is not. No, it's not. Um, and I, as, a, as a former immigration attorney myself, representing undocumented individuals and families in federal immigration court uh, from removal, um, people that have lived here for 25 years and then suddenly getting a removal notice uh, versus those who have just been here um, and we're at an asylum center, and and I haven't met them in person either. But I'm I'm appearing for them remotely. There's a whole spectrum, and no matter which individual or, or group of individuals or families you choose, they're all here not because they're trying to get something out of it. They're they're contributing a lot more than some other groups that are here with papers. But um, with that being said that's not a conversation that's being prioritized or centered in Congress right now um, in terms of the right discussion that should be had, the right direction that should be told, the right moral morale that should be in place to have these conversations. No one's really leading on that and centering that. And I feel that's super important. And having been an immigration attorney myself, um, it's very important to know what are some fixes that we can do here and there, whether it be with prosecutorial discretion, choosing which cases to pursue or not, um, or other measures that we could do. We can do so much, is, is I guess what I'm trying to say, Salah. We can do so much, but it all comes down to there's no priority right now yeah. in, in fixing any of those issues. Um, they're paying way more into the system for for um taxes and, and really keeping the economy going yet they're getting nothing in return that's not a land of opportunity for all that's not embodying um the the belief that everyone has the right to live in dignity and and yeah. to be able to live and, and choose in so many different ways and so yeah i i think what you just said with the debate stuff as well with the fear mongering that was happening with the scarcity mindset, with, with painting the other as continuously the other and the enemy, that's being done to the Muslim community, to other communities, to many communities that, that really shouldn't be the case because um, that's not doing good for anyone. And um, most definitely given the times right now as well. And so what we really need to paint the picture is number one, have the priority center the conversation and number two, really tell the truth. Start telling the truth of, hey, if we actually give people the equal rights, the basic necessities, really treat them as human beings, everything will pay it forward and pay back. There will be much more coming back into the economy. There will be much more going back into the communities. Actually, there will be more, there will be stronger communities, actually, in that sense. And so... Um, if we continue to have the scarcity and fear mongering, though, people aren't able to see that bigger picture of truth where we can actually do all of that if we actually set our mind to it. And so that's what we want to prioritize in our campaign and, and would love people to check our, ca our campaign out for. Um, 
Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, her main theme in the campaign is uh, building up the middle class. And we've seen in societies where the deterioration of the middle class is, means the deterioration of democracy. Uh, it is the middle class that really makes us uh, a, a strong middle class, that is, that makes America uh, great. Uh, you don't have to be great again, but, you know, having a strong middle class uh, has been America's success. Um, where do you see the middle class right now? What what are the struggles and what are you proposing in terms of helping that group? Yeah, so and that's that's the that's the problem here, Salam. It really comes down to our politics right now is not people centered in one bit to that degree. Uh, for myself, um, even though we've had the struggles and uh, have end up where we are today, grit alone is not something that will get somebody to go through anything right now. And it's because we have a system that is not people centered but corporate centered. For the past 50 years, um, even 50 years ago in the 70s, there was a concept of a three-legged stool where um, the middle class, where, where any American would be able to think of this three-legged stool, one stool would be savings, one stool would be um, pension, uh, one stool would be retirements, but most people don't participate in investments, so take that stool out. And then in the 70s, you have the death of the pension where it was more common for even private sector to have pensions, but as corporations started paying out money to government, started um, going to the government politicians and leaders and saying, hey, we're, we're paying so much right now. And um, eventually the corporation's utmost priority used to be taking care of their employees and the maximum benefit and welfare of their families, the employees' families, but then it became how to maximize profit for our shareholders, cutting uh, corners at every expense possible, even at the livelihood of our workers. And so for the past 50 years, there's been a transfer of uh, $50 trillion from the bottom 90% to the top 10%. Um, and with that being said, uh, we don't have what's called a living wage anymore. And that's why people are working two to three jobs to make men's meet. That's why um, most Americans are living one to month. And, and Back to your question, there's there's probably no, I mean, the middle class is disappearing. Um, and there's there's we have the biggest um income wealth inequality, um, both on the income level and wealth equality ever, inequality ever. And so with that being said, we're just going to see that get even more extreme and worse if we really don't um do a U-turn and really centered on the people. And so our campaign is focused on people-centered politics. So how do we change that structure, David? So we change that structure by banning corporate PAC money, ending the corporate influence of politics. Right now we have a system in politics and I, I phrase it and people can quote me on it. I think it's the biggest money laundering system that we see happening before our eyes, where every election we have corporate PACs and special interests funding these uh, incumbents and politicians to be reelected then during, after they're elected, then they give out that money from the budget to back to these corporate PACs and special interests in what I call corporate welfare with all of these dole outs and, and big handouts and whatnot. And yet the people here at the bottom, while this is going on at the top, corporate PACs and special interest funding politicians, politicians giving that back from the budget, people are here receiving nothing. They continue to struggle. And so how we need to flip that is really end that corporate influence, banning corporate PAC money, um, introducing democracy vouchers. It's this idea of giving everyone, let's say, 100 U.S. democracy dollars. Um, I give you 100 U.S. democracy dollars, Salam. You take 50, donate it to our campaign. You take 20, you donate it to um, some other city council member, Isabel Gerardo here in L.A. or, or whatnot. And then with that being said, it increases people's power and influence of elections and allows them to be more civically engaged. And incumbents who are taking corporate PAC money cannot participate in that system unless they give it up. Then they're able to participate in that system. Um, we need to introduce uh, ranked choice voting. Um, this idea where it's more democratic and really centers the votes on people's choices. In a primary election where you have 10 candidates, the 10th candidates votes would be redistributed to the ninth, redistributed to the eighth and so forth. That way we have more democratic results. In um, LA City right now, for example, we have a CD14 race. In the primary election, there were a lot of candidates um, against this disgraced city council member currently. And if we had ranked choice voting in place, 
he would not have ended up in top two. He would have been knocked out of the general and we would actually be able to vote on two progressive candidates here. So that's the way we actually get people-centered politics in place. Um, and then that's the first core value. But but yeah, yeah. going back to your question, um, middle class, it's not people-centered right now, Salam, and we need to do all that we can to make our politics people-centered. Well, yeah, and I, and I believe that there's, there's, you know, in terms of people-centered policy and people-centered uh, uh, structure, there's nothing more glaring than what's happened in Gaza, and now for over 40,000 killed. At least that's that's what we know of. We don't know how many people are still under the rubble. Uh, 100,000 uh, injured, uh, many of them severely injured. Um, and the U.S. is financing, protecting, enabling, providing weapons every day. You have a very um, um, strong position on that. Could you, could you outline your position on ending this, this these atrocities? Yeah, so the people-centered government, not just, it doesn't just utterly fall on its face domestically, Salam, but it also falls on its face foreign as well, like what you just pointed out with the genocide that's happening in Gaza. Um, the U.S. is actively and complicit, um, what I call it, in the genocide that's going on because it's our U.S. Congress um, is the one that authorized it. Whether or not they put on these performative acts of um, calling on, allegedly calling on ceasefires, but then not signing House Resolution 786, or on the flip side, even doing more and funding 20 plus billion more dollars as a Congress member. And that includes my opponent that I'm also running against, who also voted to authorize and fund more military um, a weapon and aid going to that and then yet saying he cares about Palestinians and what's going on and and we all know that um, you really need to support your words with your actions and and what's clear for us right now is our government although they say one thing they're insidiously deceiving us by doing completely another um, quelling these student protests on campuses um, stripping people's rights to protest um, painting those who are actually standing up to speak as being anti-Semitic, as, as being one thing or not. My opponent, the one we found out that one of his attacks for the next eight cycles will be that I'm anti-Semitic. Um, and so in, in all that regard, and so it, it's we, we must call for an arms weapons embargo right now. Um, and that's not something that our Congress member will do. So if you're not gonna do it and you're gonna continue to send out money doing um, horrible things with the genocide when our people are also struggling and we could actually be using that money for good both here and abroad, then then it's your time to get out. And so um, that is our stance, um, Salam, and we will continue to do that. Um, and we started doing that as a candidate and have been actively involved in, in voicing that and attending actions and learning more as well. And I believe that's where um, yeah, that, that's where I had, had gone to the mosque and, um, and learned even more um, about the presentations that MPAC had presented as well. Yeah, you have a very interesting proposal in, in getting the UN Security Council to form uh, a criminal justice uh, process to bring war criminals to the UN Security Council. Can you, can you outline what your, what your thinking is there, what, what the steps are? Well, there's no concrete specific steps yet, um, Salam, but it's, it, it all started in this root um, idea, root experiences of even what's going on today, uh, what's happening in Bangladesh, what's what's happening elsewhere in the sense of, we have these atrocities happening right before our eyes being reported by media news, yet they just remain as media news. Nothing's being done about that. Why is that the case? Do we not have laws in place? Do we not have tribunals or councils in place to deal with this? And if not, then we need to, find ways to make sure that this doesn't happen again by putting those things in place. And so what you just pointed out is a starting point for where we want to go to in framing our foreign policy and what the action items that we want to complete. And for, for times like this, individuals like Netanyahu must be brought on as a war criminal now because he continues to proactively do what do what he's doing right now. And so um, in that sense, if, if, if the UN in its current state is is not in a state to allow for that, then we must do more um, to help push towards that. Uh, Fatwa, do you have any 
Any questions? I have many questions, but you start taking my question. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I got you started, so you can go you go to the third question then. <laughs> okay, let's just start with first question. California has a diverse population with varying needs. How will you ensure that all voices and community are represented in your policy making? Yes, so thank you, Fatima. Um, because now that comes to our second core value of the platform, which is co-governance. Our first was people-centered politics, co-governance. It's as if you read our website. So our co-governance part is for the past 50 years, what has also happened is our representatives have been taking commands from party leaders and special interests at the top right here. Um, when And they've been legislating and doing that whole system when actually it should be us here that they're talking with that they're co-governing with, that they're talking about finding out what my needs are here, what the proposed issues and solutions I think would be helpful to my family, to my community, to my neighbors, uh, to, to the, the groups that I'm in. And then that representative taking it back to Washington, putting that into legislation, coming back to their constituency, co-governing with them, reporting back and, and doing that process and fine tuning it. That's the co-governance that we need, Fatima. And so, um, Right now, currently in Congress, there's no legal requirement for any Congress member to, to meet with their constituent. There's no legal requirement for them to phone call their constituent. There's no legal requirement for them to hold town halls for their constituents. So one of the things we wanna do is pass a responsive representation bill, which requires all 435 Congress members to hold a monthly public town hall that is advanced and noticed, both virtual and in-person, two weeks in advance, not one hour before when you're at work and you get an automated robocall saying, join the Congress members town hall, that you join and then they don't they don't let you answer ask your questions because they filter five questions. Um, so not that kind of system, but a responsive representation bill that calls for a monthly public town hall, that calls for office hours in every congressional district, that calls for an online constituent portal where constituents can log in, submit their request, propose their legislative policies, get feedback on that, a constituent lobbying day where constituents can lobby for certain things, a constituent caucus, a council that is made up from all of the different neighborhoods and communities of a district. In a, neighbor, in a district like ours, we have 22 neighborhoods. Uh, that's a lot. And so whether it be just geographically or based on ethnicity and religion as well, um, in, in all of those aspects and having those roundtable conversations, direct town halls, direct conversations with um, community leaderships, um, mosques, churches, grassroots organizations, and all of that, because that's how we can really cater the needs of, of everyone, like you said, Fatima, with the diverse population and really knowing what those needs are. Um, because if we're not talking with them directly, then how do we know what they want? Um, and I believe right now, um, we're having these representatives tell us, oh, this is what you want, David, this is what you want, Fatma. And we're like, that's not quite what we need right now. We need more. And it's because there's no conversation. And so that's what we'll uh, be promising and we'll be doing. Thank you. I have a second question for you. What is your approach to ensuring that the voices of uh, marginalizing, mar marginalized groups like Arab American and Muslim Amer American are heard and consider in the policy making process. Yeah, I I believe it's very important with a lot of members of the Muslim community already being at the forefront, pushing for justice, both locally and nationally. And I feel that it's not just engaging Muslim voices or other minority voices on hot button issues that are particular to that group, perhaps whether it be foreign policy or security, but really amplifying that voice on um, a broader national level, whether that be with health, housing, healthcare, economic security, environmental justice, um, and then all of that. And that also involves the flip side of it, that we're making sure that people aren't being discriminated, that, that um, we're really combating those areas of hate crimes and um, really repealing policies that are calling for surveillance of one community over another when that shouldn't be the case. Um, so, so those are things that we would definitely be prioritizing and fighting for. Also, how should you, how should the U.S. approach ongoing conflict and instability in regions like the Middle Eastern and Africa? Um, right now, given that we need to stop 
prioritizing our use of money and resources to other countries committing crimes mm -hmm. or other governments committing crimes and redirect that to helping areas that really need it where um, where we can be able to be uh, an instrument in negotiating peace. And I believe that one of the horrible things that have caused us to come here as, as a country and government is, is, is firstly just greed of money, number one. It's, it's all about money. We have so many tight interests in our own military defense contractors uh, with all of that included. And, um, and number two, just um, for the past several decades, War has always been the central policy of our foreign policy instead of peace. And you put your money where your mouth is. We're spending billions and billions of dollars on war. But then when you look at our Secretary of State Department, it's minuscule. And our Secretary of State is really in charge of the peacemaking. And, and we want to push and help create a Department of Peace. Um, and that we feel that that's necessary. And we need to put our money where our mouth is and, and prioritize and budget in those ways so that we can actually help um, in areas like Middle East and um, and North Africa, as you said. Thank you. One more, um, this question, as you know, most of the most or 99% from the Muslim community and Arab community right now, they are uh, very hard broken and they are very, very concerned about what's going on and the, the genocide in Gaza. How do you appro uh, propose the U.S. address concern about human human right violation and petitional war crime in Gaza? Um, number one, it should. It's I, I pause because just in disbelief that nothing has been done, and that's why I paused. Um, but number one. Ar arms embargo, arms embargo, arms embargo, ceasefire. Um, the U.S. has all the power to do what it has um, to do in that sense. And that's the first thing to, to really stop being the active player in it. Um, and then number two, um, calling it out where it is, where the U.S. should actually be leading in calling this out as a, a crime, calling it out as something to be addressed before the U.N. and the necessary authorities. But it's not right now. And we know that because... For the past several decades, um, the Israeli government has has influenced our American politicians. If for for those watching, there's a documentary on YouTube. You can watch it easily. It's called "The Occupation of the American Mind," and you can see how our American politics and government have been bought out by Israeli interests. And so, um, so in in that regard, in the Middle East or or elsewhere, and I think it's just this pattern of where does the money go to? Can we get more of that? That's where our allegiance will be. And that's what our government has been sold out to. Um, and so we really need to, while addressing the root causes of that, um, also be able to create a new vision and new way forward. Thank you. Okay, last question, I promise. Okay, all right. We'll how, do you plan, how do you plan to address the rising cost of living and housing affordability in California? As you know, how much is expensive? People cannot afford it even. Thank you, Fatma. Yes. So you just pinpointed on our third, um, well, it's, it's not our third, but it's part of our third core value of our platform, which is life empowering policies. Um, for life empowering policies, we've heard politicians say housing, healthcare, uh, people need to live, living wage. We've heard that for election over election, over election, over election. And they're just empty campaign promises and lip service because the foundation's rotten, because there's no people-centered government, because there's no co-governance. But now these life-empowering policies will truly become life-empowering policies because we will change the definition and the representation of what a representative is um, and in that. And so naturally, once you have people-centered politics and co-governance, life-empowering policies will come out and one of those life empowering policies that we need right now, Fatma, while we work towards getting jobs with living wages and increasing that minimum wage um, and putting the burden of insurance and stuff on, on the government, once we, while we're working towards that, people need help right now. And so things like a basic income would be so helpful to them and so empowering. It would be able to directly lift people up. One of the ways that Martin Luther King Jr. said in his book, where do we go from here? He said, one of the direct ways to abolish poverty 
is and to really address the affordability and those issues is to directly lift people out is a basic income. Like that cuts through the red tape, the bureaucracy of a lot of needs based programs and things as well. Um, while keeping those in place, I'm not saying to cut those, but but it's it's just the example that it goes straight to the core and we need those issues. And uh, Fatma, I, I made so many calls to constituents um, earlier during the cycle um, where to the point I called um, several thousand constituents actually. And the top five issues, number one was affordability. Affordability was at the top. And it's, it's, it's insane that um, you have two families living in one bedroom apartments, even in the neighborhood that I'm living in. Um, and so we need to address that with basic income. We need to address that with more programs and resources. And there are ways to do that. We do have the resources and money to do it. It's just that it's not a priority because our money's tangled elsewhere and our allegiance is tangled elsewhere. Thank you. Kwasi, Huda, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, I have a question that uh, you all ask about that. And um, uh, I'm admit with uh, David that if we talk about anything, uh, uh, justice about uh, Philistine, then you become an anti-Semitist. And uh, that's that's the biggest problem. And, uh, you know, we have a, uh, a double standard for foreign policy that uh, when it comes about uh, other things uh, that interest uh, uh, <clears throat> about uh, any kind of interest, uh, they are not admit about it. So now what you can do uh, or because, you know, the, uh, in our community, uh, they decided not to give a vote because of uh, of this situation in in uh, Palestine and uh, Israel. So uh, when Kamala came, and then slowly it's uh, it's changing some thoughts, but now you came too. So what we tell to our community about this issue, what you narrate. So we have to tell uh, something to the our community that. Okay, Kim, De uh, Kim uh, David Kim, he, uh, he has uh, this uh, attitude about this, uh, towards these issues. Yeah, no, thank you, Kwasi. Um, given everything that's going on right now, we, we truly, truly, truly need strong leadership coming out with a bang saying, hey, what's happening is wrong. We need to go this way instead. But we're not seeing that right now. And a lot of people are disappointed, um, depressed, um, very hope hopeless because of that. And it's it's understandable. But I would just say don't give that hope up because there's people like myself, there's other down ballot candidates out there, there's other campaigns, orgs out there doing the work steadily and consistently still to encourage you to also do the work and to not keep the hope out, but to keep it always firing and on light. Um, because it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, Quasi. For myself, this is my third time running. It's not easy. I I work full time, and then I also campaign. Um, the first time we got forty seven percent. The second time we got forty nine percent. This time we're gonna get fifty one and above percent. But it's not easy, and we need to put in the time. We need to sow the seeds. You, nothing. And this is this is not. It's 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 the time until gold lesson that our parents tell us like. You need, it takes time and um, you you gather, you make, and then you wait and you continue doing that process. And um, I would say that for those who are registered to vote, please vote and please cast your vote in the certain districts that you are in. But of course, be mindful of who you're voting for and that's your choice to vote for at the local level, state, county, federal, who are standing for these issues right now because this is something that I said on a on on an interview um, on another one because how you do one thing is how you do everything and and if your representative or that candidate that you're looking at isn't coming out strongly on an issue that's super close to your heart, then don't vote for them. <laughs> I mean that that I mean in, in terms of that, but but there are but I'm saying that in regards to all of the races that you will be considering on your ballot. But please do go vote because there are candidates. Uh, like myself, who are running hard, um, who are calling for an end to the arms embargo, who, who, as soon as I get elected, will keep whichever president 
gets elected accountable. And I will make sure, um, and I will be knocking on those White House doors. I don't know what the protocol is yet, but whether it be that way or another, I will be knocking every day to make sure that um, this is prioritized and at, at center um, and that we have somebody protesting inside as well. Do you know Thank how you. many uh, candidates for Congress are calling for a ceasefire? I I don't have on that. one hand. Yeah, <laughs> no, I I don't have that number to be honest. I none. Yeah. And what's funny, Salam, is right when you asked that question, no faces popped up. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so I don't know what the number is. So yeah, are people? Do you think people are just scared of the APAC money coming out against them if they do call for a ceasefire? Yeah. So so some people have been telling us, um, Salam, don't get too big, David. Don't get too big because obviously once we win, our race and campaign will be all over the news nationally once we win. But until we get there, some people have told us, David, don't don't campaign too hard where APAC hears of you and finds out that you actually almost beat Jimmy last time because they're, they're going to suddenly funnel 20 million into his race then. And, and we're like, okay, okay, we won't get too big, but we need to get big enough to win. So, um, so we, I mean, we, there is that concern, Salam, but I'm not scared of it, nor is Cindy, my campaign manager, nor are any of our team members, because we're living out biomorals. We started this campaign yeah. biomorals, and we're going to finish it.